Hey, this is Passy from Passy's World of ICT, the guy with the white hat. And today, yeah, we're, you should be at a stage now from like doing our course where you can start building applications. And that's the plan for today. We're going to start building like a real world application for a restaurant ordering system for Bob's Burgers. And we're also going to introduce uh, using CSV files because we've been using XML files in our lesson, but this one will actually read a CSV file. So let's get started here. So we're building the first parts of the burger and ordering system. So this is part one and there will be a part two as well. But in part one, we're going to do a lot of work here. We're going to build this form. And what's going to happen is you can have your name on there, your phone number, the date from a date time picker. And then over here, you click and pick what you want, uh, your burger and what toppings and extras you want on it. Add that on and you can have side orders of fries or onion rings. Add each of those on one by one. Add drinks one by one. And what will happen is you'll get this order form that's filled out here. Now, because there's not a lot of space, uh, what we've done is we've used two character item codes. So GB is like a a ground beef burger with tomato sauce, TS, CH is cheese, LE is lettuce, TO is your tomato. You can read them all down the side here on the uh, click and pickers. And it's gonna work out the total, how much all that order is. And if everything validates out okay, and we click add order, it's gonna say the order has been added successfully with a success message. So uh, that's kind of how it's gonna work and that's what we're gonna build. So this will be a big job. And we suggest that uh, you just pause the video when you've had enough and you need to stop and do some building or some thinking about things. And then you can always use the uh, time code index in the video description to come back and resume from where you want, where we're on. So we're actually gonna build this up as usual in stages and versions. So version one, we're gonna build that big form and the user will be able to pick and click the items that they want to order. Okay, so we'll be setting up a checked list box is something new. That's what we're using for all those toppings that go on the burger. We haven't done one of those before. Uh, but we're gonna also be using radio buttons, group boxes and data grid view, which we have done before in previous lessons. So that should all be familiar territory to most people. Uh, we'll keep a running total for the order. So each time you add an item, it's gonna uh, redo all the prices and work out what the latest current total is. So you can see that on the screen. And for the prices, we're gonna actually be reading in a CSV file, a comma separated values file of those prices. Put it in a data table and we read it in with a uh, good old IO stream reader, which we have done before in VBNet. And that'll all be good. And then once it's in the loaded data table, we can search through for each of those uh, two character item codes. We can find out what the price is for each one. And that way keep adding the prices on till we've got a total for that particular order. So we'll be using a loop um, inside a loop to scan through the entire data grid view. And we've done that in previous lessons. So that shouldn't be too um, new to people or too kind of overwhelming because we have done that before. And of course we need to add user input validation in and we're gonna add a clear button so that once you've done an order and finished it and added it on, then you can have another customer and start a new order for them. But first you need to like clear out the whole screen so you'll be able to do that again. So clear and reset. So a future part two lesson, that'll actually, um, when they add the order, it's gonna actually save it to an external file so that we've got everyone's orders in a file. And then you'll be able to do a search. So you can put in someone's name and their phone number and what date the order was. And it's gonna search through that external file and be able to find their order and put it up onto the screen so we can look at it. But that's all gonna be in part two because as you'll see, there's enough work here to do, certainly in part one. So the first thing is build that very big main form and so let's go through the items that are on there so that uh, heading Bob's burgers how we did that was we used cooltext.com to actually make that text and then we saved it as a PNG file so that it would have a clear background and we just have the lettering so that was just put into a picture box to go onto the form so that's not any kind of special visual basic text or anything that came from cool text and we just saved it as a picture of a clear background and put it inside a picture box. So that's how we got that done. Now this fabulous background here with the three burgers in it, uh, we purchased that from 123RF uh, so that we could have that as a stock image which we could use in our video and in our publications. But look, uh, you may not be able to get that exact one and there's no point in buying it. There's probably plenty of pictures on the internet of hamburgers. So you just need some sort of 
background that uh, suits the thing you're doing. All right, so you can find that on Google Images and just use that because it's only for education purposes. You're not publishing or selling anything. And then we're using group boxes, which we've used before, our good old group box here. But we've made the background. In the background, when you pick the colors, if you go to web for the color type on the tabs and pick transparent, it'll give you a nice clear background. So these have got a clear background and the radio buttons we've put into them, we just made them have a black background. Okay, so that's how we sort of got this clear with the black in it. Uh, was by doing that. So we've got all these different radio buttons which are called OPT, the options you can click. So there's opt chicken, opt ground beef, opt fries, opt onion rings, opt water, opt Pepsi and opt lemon uh, for the drink. So all of those little round dot things you can pick and click, uh, they're radio buttons and we've done them before. And when you put them inside a group box like this, it means they can only pick one of the radio buttons in the group box. So you'll only be able to pick um, chicken burger or ground beef uh, when you're adding on an item, okay? So that's why they are particularly useful. And then this one to be able to do all of the extras that are gonna go on top of the burger, the options, uh, that's a new thing, that's a checked list box. All right, so we've just called it CHKLB for check list box, and it's called extras. Now in that, you go in and there's the items, okay, as one of the properties. So when you've got that on your form, you drag it out onto your form, then you go to the items in the properties and there's a triple dots little uh, icon with three dots on it, a little button that you click that's the builder. And when you go into the builder, what it's gonna do is it'll enable you to type in all of these things. So you can put tomato sauce, or if you're in America, tomato sauce, or maybe you wanna use ketchup actually if you're in America, but anyway, TS. And you can type in onions dash on cheese dash ch. Put these all on separate lines, and they're going to become items which come up in the checked list box when you run it. And these are sort of uh, boxes here where you can tick or untick just by clicking your mouse. Now they're set up for some reason to have two kind of clicks to make it happen. One click perhaps to untick it if it was ticked, and another click to retick it. It's a lot better to uh, go to the property check on click. Uh, which is for that checklist box and just set it to true and then it'll just be easy one click uh, to get your ticks in there all right so that's something else you need to do on the properties of that and the good old button btn add burger so once we've picked and clicked all those things you want me to do add burger and then it's going to come over in here which is going to be the data grid view but we're not up to that yet now when we set this up we just use these two um two character codes here like CH for chicken was obvious, but then CH for cheese was really obvious as well. And then when we were checking this after we'd done the screen print and half of the animation for the PowerPoint, um, we realized, uh oh, we've got chicken CH and cheese is CH as well. So we need to change one of those two. So what you need to do is just call chicken CB for chicken burger. So don't have it like CH like we've got on the form here, call it CB, okay, for chicken burger. Then every uh, item code will have a unique value and won't have uh, double ups. And the other thing is at the moment, when we first designed the form too, it was laid out like this, but then we found there wasn't enough room for the data grid view. So you'll see in the next uh, pictures of the form that what's happened is, or when you looked at that previous one where we were running the program, uh, what happened was that these things here had actually been moved to be down across the bottom and the data grid view stretched back to be able to take up some more room to fit everything in. But you'll kind of figure that out anyway. Once something's in a group box, you can move the whole group box around and it's very easy to do. But let's continue with what's on this form because there's so much. Okay, we need BTN add drink and BTN add side. So that's for adding a side order or a drink onto our total order there. This guy here is just showing up as a red rectangle at the moment, but that's actually our data grid view. So we dragged the data grid view out onto the form and it's called DG view order is its name. And we set the back color to web red. So we just use the web tab and set red on that. Now you also uh, set the column size in the properties. There's a property auto size columns mode. Make sure that's set to all cells. Uh, because otherwise it's gonna leave, make the cells columns way wider than we need them to be. And uh, it won't all fit on the form. So you need to make that adjustment. And then use your rows default cell style and click on the triple dots builder, which we did do in a previous lesson. Uh, 
and in there you get this builder and you need to set your back color to red your four color to white and the selected row um, color to orange okay so make sure you set all that up in rows default cell style so there's a little triple dots button you click on that's the builder it'll take you into a panel it opens up where you can set all of those things and then this text box here that's going to display how much the total of the order is in dollars uh, that's text box called txt total then up the down the bottom we got the btn clear order to clear the order now up the top and we might just have to move bassy uh, across because he's going to be in the way of all of this so we'll just move him across while we're doing the video later on and we've got txt uh, order name up here this second one here is txt order form this guy here is a date time picker so you need to find date time picker in the objects and drag that out and uh, that's going to show the date and I don't think we've mentioned it here, but you have to go to its properties and make sure the property is set to short so it only shows the date and not the time as well. Okay, that was shown in a previous uh, lesson, but on that date time picker, yeah, you need to go to the properties and make sure that uh, the display, one of the properties is set to short, so it's short date format, all right? Or just Google it, it'll look for it in Stack Overflow and you'll figure that one out yourselves because you're um, big boy and big girl programmers now because you've done a lot of lessons with us and now we're building a whole application. So like, this is really exciting. Uh, we've got our BTN add order here and we've got another button here, BTN order search. Uh, that's actually gonna be for part two. We're not gonna be able to fit that into part one, but put them on the form now. And yeah, that's the whole form design. Design. So that might take you a while to get that all set up and then once you have we can move on to the next thing and the next thing is double click anywhere on that form and we need to set up a data table to start off with so public class form one we're just dimensioning a data table as a new data table so we've done data tables before in a previous lessons but if you haven't this is what you need to do and then when you double click anywhere on the form it'll take you into the form one load subroutine now We've defined the data table up there outside of the subroutine. In the subroutine, we need to add in um, all of the rows that are going to go in there, all right? So in the data table, we need uh, rows for every item on that form which you could pick and click. So there was the CB chicken burger, the ground beef burger. There's all those toppings which can go on the burger, mustard, mayonnaise, egg, chili sauce. Then there's the side orders, the fries or the onion rings. Then there's the three different drinks you can get, a water, a Pepsi or a lemon, okay? So all of those uh, need to go on here. And we're just giving them two character item codes and they're all system string, okay? So we're gonna set up all the columns for our data table as well. And then once a data table set up, to display it on the form in that data grid view, it's so simple, it's just one little line. You just say that for the data grid view, DGV, DG view order is what we've called it for its name and its property, um, dot data source. So we want the data source for that to be this order data table, okay? And that's going to set that up. Now, because we don't have a lot of space in that form, we're using these little abbreviations and you'll see that um, coming up when the program runs. You'll see all those little codes across the top for the column names. Otherwise, you can't possibly fit it across. So you don't have room to put beef or chicken or chili sauce or any of that. We need to use these codes. And look, they're pretty simple and it shouldn't be a big deal having to use them. And we haven't set any column widths here in the coding. Because remember, we did that back when we set up the data grid view. Make sure you've got that autumn size columns mode in the properties. Make sure that's set to all cells, okay? And what are we doing next? We've got to double click the add burger button now. So we're going to work on processing, uh, adding a burger onto the order, depending on what they've selected in that left-hand side burger area of the form. So what we need to do is we need to go through and we have to check uh, what they've clicked. So remember there's all these data items here for burgers. There's 11 of those because they can pick chicken, uh, burger or ground beef burger then there's all the different toppings they can click that they may have this or leave it unclicked and not have it and here's the side orders the fries and the onion rings and the drinks all these ones here we've circled in blue uh, that isn't going to be part of a burger order when we're adding a line item for a burger we have to add them as separate items on the order so we want all of these to be set to uh, nothing in the data grid view and how we're doing nothing is we're using the symbol of two dashes so just dash dash so what we're doing here with all of this checking is we're saying okay if on that radio button if they've clicked the chicken one that they want a chicken burger then 
we make the order row have CB on it. Okay, and we set it to CB. Otherwise, we're going to have the new order row uh, just have dash dash two hyphens here or two dashes so that means um, there's nothing for chicken burger then we have to check have they ticked or clicked in the GB the beef burger option and if they have we need to put GB in if they have not we need to put dash dash and then we need to go through all of these different um, things here so CB, CB, GB, GB here and TS, that's the name of the column. So it knows to set up, oh, okay, for that column on this row, we're just having it set to GB. Now, if they have clicked TS for tomato sauce, in, in the TS column, we need to have it say TS in that uh, column. But if they haven't ticked that, then we would just want it to say dash dash. And uh, there's a lot of these to do. And we need to do all 11 here. Either have them, if they've ticked it, put the... Uh, item code in but if they have not ticked it put two dashes in all right so let's continue with this uh, now we haven't added them all in because it, uh, to show here in the presentation because there's 11 of them right uh, sorry there's all of these ones here still to do so we just did chicken burger uh, the ground beef burger and the tomato sauce the tomato sauce the ketchup but we did not do these ones. These ones are done and they all look the same and you can just copy and paste them basically. So we just did uh, these last two here, the egg and the chili sauce. Okay, so you can see those. If uh, they've ticked EG for egg, well then we want to put EG in our data grid view so that we know that they've ordered an egg on their burger. Otherwise we put dash dash and then we got chili sauce. Now all these other things like a side order of drinks cannot be part of a burger item. They're not part of the actual burger. So they all need to be set to dash dash uh, for those, which is our symbol meaning nothing, meaning nothing's been ordered there. So once we've got that row all formatted and we've picked out what all of its columns are going to equal, whether they're going to equal a, uh, a code if they do want that item or whether they're going to equal dash dash if they have not clicked to have that item, if they don't want that item, uh, what we're going to do then is once we made the whole row, all we have to do is just uh, add that new order row into our data table that's inside the program memory. And then re we just do another refresh that our data grid view uh, for the order that is on the form that you can see, that's just going to get refreshed now and get the latest copy of the order data table. Okay, so it should have all those item rows in it for the things that we've ordered. Okay, so when we test that, what we've got here is we've added a whole lot of items on one by one separately. And so you can easily see that if the burger is chicken or ground beef, and you can see what extras need to go onto each burger. So here we just tried out a whole bunch of burgers because we were just doing the add burger button. So really only working on this left hand side of the form here. But you can see on the first one they picked to have a chicken burger and they want lettuce and mayonnaise with it. Uh, the next one they want a ground beef burger and they want tomato sauce, they want cheese, they want lettuce, they want tomato and they want egg. Uh, now, down on this last one here, they just want a ground beef burger with just some cheese and some mustard. All right, so what's happened is they've uh, picked and clicked what they wanted, done add burger, and each time they do add burger, it adds another order item into this data grid view, okay? And if they did not order, like let's have a look here, um, let's see. You know, a lot of times, no, they didn't want TO, tomatoes, on their burger. So you can see here, these dashes mean that those burgers don't have any tomatoes on them. These dashes here mean that those uh, three burgers do not have any lettuce on them, okay? So the dashes mean nothing's been ordered there. And for any burger order you're doing, the fries, onion rings, drinks um, should all be dashes, just dash dash to indicate that they're not part of a burger. All right, so hopefully that's all making sense because uh, the other cool thing we needed to tell you was too, that if you make mistakes, so say in this first burger, they did actually want tomato on it. You can go in here and edit this by hand and carefully type in capital T, capital O, all right? And if on this burger they decided they didn't want the mayonnaise, the MA, you can carefully go in there and just backspace and put dash dash in there. So this whole data grid view is editable, uh, which is kind of nice as well. All right, so that's uh, just something to note. All right, now coding the add burger button. 
Now the only thing is that what can happen is in the testing we noticed was that they could maybe not have selected anything at all for their burger or any kind of thing on the order form at all and put maybe a name or phone or even leave that blank at the moment because we haven't put validation in yet and then just click add order and it makes this completely nulls row everything is nothing okay so that's not good because there's no point in putting a nothing row into the uh, data grid view. So we needed to figure out a way of fixing that for the burger order. <coughs> we just used a quick way because most people are gonna want beef burgers when they're ordering a burger. So we're just gonna default this so that this one's automatically clicked onto ground beef. And if they want chicken, they'll just have to click and change it. But what we do in the uh, <coughs> form load subroutine is just add one line in here that the opt ground beef check just make that true okay so this one's always ticked so if they add order with nothing there at least we'll have a, a row with gb in it but we have got validation later on anyway to check uh that they have ordered stuff all right now we also had to fix that null order thing because you could do that on um, drinks or sides as well Okay, so in the code for those, uh, we've got the button adding the side. We needed some code in there. If opt fries check, if they haven't ticked uh, fries and they have not ticked onion rings, well then we need to give them a message. Please pick and click a side order item. So if they're gonna go click that button to add a side order on, but both of the check things are not checked, because both of these are false, that's bad. So we don't do anything. We just give them an error message there or a, a help message. Please click and pick a side order item. And the same when they click the drink button. So in that subroutine, we just need to have some coding. If water isn't checked, if Pepsi's not checked and lemon's not checked, so they all three are sitting there unchecked at the moment because their checked status is false for all three of them. We're going to tell the user to please pick and click a drink item or stop clicking that add button because you haven't got any drinks to add in. <laughs> All right, so that's gonna just fix some little problems. So you always need to be doing thorough testing as you go along step by step and just trying to think of all the We've talked about this before, all the Homer Simpson kind of things people can do on forms and make sure you've got everything covered. Which leads us now to challenge task one, a challenge task. So early in the video, Passy, what's going on? Uh, we're changing it up a bit here. And we're going to challenge you because you've been doing a lot of programs. So it's about time you got challenged. So look, we just showed you how to do the uh, burger order. So it should be very simple if you understand that code, just for you to code up to be able to do a side order or get yourself a drink, okay? So all we have to do there is uh, do similar coding like we did with burger. And here's a test run here just showing that when someone uh, put fries, they clicked on the fries radio button and then they clicked add side order. We got just everything, nothing's here except fries are FR. So we know that's an order for fries. Um, here where DW is, that's a uh, bottled water, a drink of water. So we know they've ordered some water for this item. This item is where they've ordered onion rings as a side. This is a drink, all the D things over here are drinks. DW is water, DP is Pepsi, and DL is lemon. So they've ordered a Pepsi there, a lemon drink. And down the bottom here, they've actually ordered a burger, a chicken burger by the looks of it with lettuce and mayo. Oh, that sounds nice. Okay, so you should be able to add the code to get side orders, fries and onion rings and the three different type of drinks working. So you need to sort of do that. So pause the video now. Go off and do that coding, do the testing, get it all working. And then we aren't finished yet. We are not finished. We have more work to do and uh, we'll get on to that. Okay, I've been going 23 minutes. That's so gonna be another long one, perhaps be you know playing this video at 1.5x speed because I can tend to talk slowly sometimes and go on a little bit too much. So make sure you, you are doing that. And, uh, let's get on with it. So we need to keep a running total of the cost of the order. So as they add items, those items cost money and we need to be adding up how much money do they need to pay us for this whole order for all these things that they're getting, all the things they're picking and clicking. So we need to define another data table for our program. So up the top where we've got form one and we did that order data table, we're going to do another one called prices data table and we're going to define a public variable. Um, 
because we have to actually go searching this table to find the prices of things. So if someone wants lettuce, they need to go and find where LE is in that table, the code for lettuce, and find out what the price of lettuce is, and then that can be added onto uh, the total. So uh, we're just going to set up a decimal value here. DEC found prices decimal equals 0, 0.00. You'll see where that fits in later on. And the design approach is going to be to load up that prices data table with item codes and their prices and load that up when the form loads. And then we're going to loop through uh, the order data grid view looking for where item codes are. So if we see a CB for chicken burger, we know, hey, we've got an item code. So we're going to go look up the prices data table and find out what the price is for a chicken uh, burger from that data table for prices. And we're going to add that onto the total. And then when we see they want mayo, we're going to look up the price of mayo and the prices data table, find out what that price is and add that onto the total as well. So the total will keep getting bigger and bigger as they're clicking add burger or add drink or add side order okay so that's what's going to be happening here so it's actually going to take a bit of code to do this it's not quite as simple as you might think it is uh, but anyway we can get it done and let's get into it so what we need to do is in that form load subroutine uh, where we had some things we need to uh, go in now and Remember how we had to add all those item codes in when we were setting up that order um, data table? We do the same sort of thing here, but there aren't nearly as many columns, thank goodness. It's only a two column table. So this one, the width and the end width to set up the columns, uh, we just need the item code and the item price, okay? They're the two columns. Now item code is gonna be system string, but price, we wanna be able to add that up. So that's gonna be a double, system dot double there. Uh, so it can handle decimals like, 50 cents, 0 0.50 and things like that, okay? So just make sure that is system double there. So we've got our prices data table column set up, so that's all good. Now we're gonna add the required data for the order items. So remember, out of all those different things I can pick and click, there's 16 of them on that form altogether. Uh, so rather than try and put it all into this form load subroutine, we're just gonna call this whole separate subroutine to do that called load prices data table. So when the form loads, it's going to be doing all its form load stuff and then it's going to go to this subroutine load prices data table and that'll do all the uh, the grinding and the work to get that table loaded up okay just in another subroutine so let's go and look at what that other subroutine is going to have so this load prices data table subroutine uh, is going to look like this or it could look like this one way you could do it is you could just do hard coding so for each item code, each of those 16 items, we need to first just to mention, hey, we're gonna put a new row into that uh, prices data table here. And this one's gonna be, we wanna set the item code column data value of CB, and we wanna set the price of CB to be $5, 5.00, but VB will only let you put in 5.0, I think, or something like that. Uh, and then we want to, now that we've set up CB and 5.0 in those two columns, we now want to actually sort of officially add that row we've formatted into the prices data table, which is what we're doing here. And then, okay, that's our first row done for chicken burger. Now the next row we need is for GB, ground beef. So we're going to need another price row, price row number two here, and that's going to be a new row. And that one's going to have item code GB and the price of that is $6. And then once we've put GB and 6.0 into the columns, then we need to officially bang, add that in and update the data table. Now we could do sort of one, two, and 14 more of these to do 16 of them hard coding like this, right? But we're not actually gonna do it like that. However, and there's always a however, if you've been watching our videos, you know there's always a however. Now the however is we're gonna use an external CSV file, a comma separated values file, and read that. That's gonna have all the item codes in there and what their prices are. And we're just gonna read that in and put it straight into the data table, okay? Which will uh, be a better way of doing it because then if you wanna change prices, you don't have to go messing around in program code. You can just load up this little CSV file. I can even do it in Microsoft Excel if you want to or in Windows Notepad. And you can just change the price there, just edit it quickly. Or even better than that, have a screen that comes up as part of the application where they can change the prices and you save it back to the CSV file. But that's getting way ahead of ourselves. Let's just uh, get back on focus of what we're doing. So this is this prices CSV file we made. It's called itemprices.csv. So we just got Windows Notepad, 
put in all of our product codes down here, all 16 of them, and then commas, all right, a comma, so you've got to have comma separated values, and then here are the prices of each of those items, so $5, $6. Each of those extras on a burger are just a dollar each. Fries are $5, onion rings are $5, and all your drinks are $3.50. Okay, so we've just set all that up. Now, this is a CSV file structure, so you've got to have comma separated values. So that's why we put these commas here. Uh, that indicates that this is a value, comma, but this guy here is a separate value. It's not part of this. So this isn't CB 5.00. This is CB for one value, and then there's another value that goes with it called 5.00. And then when you skip to a, a new line, it knows that's a new record, okay? Just like it does in a normal text file. So that's all good and set up. And then we add the following code. So we're gonna be using our system IO, because we're gonna use IO stream reader. So we need to have an imports above public class there, import system.io. And then we're getting into um, dimensioning uh, our prices CSV file, and that's just gonna be item prices.csv. So that file we made and saved, just need to copy that into the bin debug uh, folder of our project. Now, when you save it in Notepad2, you need to put it as not type text, but there's an option you can tick it. It needs to be all files. And then you put the .csv on the end, and it'll save as a .csv rather than a .txt. So just be aware of that. Um, then we set up our old stream reader stuff. So you've probably done our previous lesson. I think it was Horrible Horoscopes. Horrible Horoscopes was back where we learned about stream reader. And we need an input file as an IO stream reader. Then we need, remember stream reader reads it line by line. So as it reads in a line, we need to put that line into a variable. So we're just calling that the str input file line. So that's the kind of stuff we need um, to set up this CSV file. And this doesn't go in a subroutine or anything. This goes right up the top of the program, okay? So you need to put all that in. So it's the old stream reader reading things line by line, uh, like we've done previously in Horrible Horoscopes. It's just we got some commas there and there's a little easy way to pull out the commas, which we're gonna show you uh, very soon. But first, we just wanna check that our program can just scan through that whole CSV file and it's all working okay. So I've set up this code here, the usual sort of code, checking to make sure the file exists. So if it uh, doesn't exist, like if you forgot to copy it to bin debug, this will come up input CSV file not found. So I get this error message. Otherwise it's gonna continue here and we're gonna open the file uh, here, so opening up a new stream reader and that's the file we're using. And what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna loop through that file and keep reading it. Remember with stream reader, the end of the file has a peak of minus one. And go back to our lesson if you need to know more about that. But we're just gonna keep going through that file, reading it one line at a time until we hit the end of file at minus one. And as we read in each line, we're just gonna add one onto our counter. So we put 16 items in there. So if this can read through every item, we should get a final count of 16 here, which we're just gonna show in a message box, okay? So I ran this and checked it out and it was all good because what happened was, I was able to uh, pick up the file okay, go through it line by line with Stream Reader, and we could count that there were 16 records, which was the correct number. So that's good. So we know it's at least reading our file. So it's so important that you just build things um, iteratively or step by step. Just build another little bit on, see how it looks. Uh, Right, I don't know whether it's like a person painting a picture where they sort of paint one thing and then they sort of go back and have a look at it, maybe go off and make a cup of tea, come back and look at the painting and think, oh no, I might just change that a bit. But yeah, you need to just do it in little uh, manageable steps. So rather than try and code in all the stuff, oh yeah, here's a record, we need to load that record into the data table and do this and that. We just decided we'd just see if we could just look at all the records and just count them quickly, just to make sure our whole structure here for the stream reader and reading the file was working. And it is working, so that's really great news, all right? So now we'll go in and change that code a bit. So where we've got this um, subroutine we've been working on, remember we checked if the file existed and all that, and we had our record counter here. Uh, we're gonna put in some extra code here, and this is the kind of uh, good code that does CSV files. So uh, all you have to do is, you've done a read line and you've put that in your input file line, and all you have to do is this little thing here, this split, and what it does is that, uh, It'll take the input file line there and it's gonna split it up into column values. So when it sees a comma, it knows that that first little bit of data is finished and it can grab that and then it goes on to the next one and knows when that finishes 
either because it would hit another comma or it hits the end of the line. So this is how it can pick out those two different things from the one stream reader line that we've read in. So we can just make a new row for our data table here and in there, the record line column zero. So that first thing it found, which should be the product code, just put that into the item code of the data table. And that second thing it finds at one, because remember VB starts counting at zero. So one will be the actual second thing. Grab that and put that in the item price and then add that row into your prices data table. Okay, so this little loop here that's going through that file line by line is going to be able to pick up those two things and just put them in the data table. All right, so this is a great little way that we can just use that file and load it up quickly into our data table and it saves us um, copying and pasting like 16 times all that hard coding and stuff as well. So just that's the end of the loop there. You just have a loop statement and we also need to uh, put that in try catch notation in case anything goes wrong we can give out an error message and then when you finish with a file you should always close the file so our input file here we've just closed it now we did also have some debug messages here while we were developing this just check um, that the record count was okay and another one that as it loaded each one we were checking it out as well and checking that they loaded up into the data table. So if you do prices data table dot rows dot count, it'll count how many rows it's put in the data table. And we needed that to be 16 because obviously it was reading 16 from the file. So I just wanted to make sure that it got all 16 out of the input file and didn't sort of miss one or something through some logic in our loop and only added 15 of them. Okay, so it's good to have those little debug messages in there while you're testing it uh, just to see how it's going. And that's what we were doing there. And you can comment them back in if you need to. So what we've effectively done is that was our input file with the separated commas. Now this is all inside memory so we can't actually see it on a screen or anything but if you want to think about it what it's done is it's set up this data table it's only got two columns right we only had the item code and the item price. So it's just put all the item codes in column one as it goes through along. So here's row zero remember row zero is the first row. Uh, in VBNet. So row zero in column one, it's got CB and in column two, it's got a five. Now remember the columns are also numbered, not one and two, but zero and one. So this guy here, CB, that's actually in row zero, column zero. And this five here is actually in row zero, the first row, but it's in that column one. Okay, because first column zero, next column is one. So this guy here, GB, will be in row number one, because that was row zero. This is one. TS, tomato sauce is three, onion rings four. So cheese here will be in number five. So cheese is at row five, column zero. And the one dollar charge for it, or the price, is in row five, column one. Okay. So if we want to read through this, we have to have an outside loop, an I loop that reads each row. But as we hit a row, we need to check out both columns. We need to check out the TS item code and the price. So it's, you have a J inside there, another loop that just goes through the columns. So when you see these two loops inside each other, that's if you try and think of this in your head, that that's the data table in memory. That's kind of a visualization of it. And think about with those zero to one indexes and things, exactly what it's doing and hopefully the code will make a bit more sense. But anyway, we digress. Let's uh, do some testing here. So to get those order totals, we've managed to get our prices. So that's how we look up the prices and get them all loaded into the table. So the table's there, but we haven't actually searched it yet. This is what we're getting into next. So calculating this totals are uh, quite a big job, uh, but we'll get through it okay. So on each of these uh, buttons we've got, where we're adding a burger, adding a side, or adding a drink, um, down the very bottom, just before the subroutine ends, like this is the BTN add burger one, just add in that we're going to go to calculate order total dollars as a new subroutine and work out what is the total value of the order now that we've just added something else onto it. And likewise, they might have been adding a side order. 
fries or onion rings. So down the bottom of BTN add side, that sub, the code you've got there at the moment, um, just add this in that we need to calculate order total dollars. And maybe they were getting a drink, maybe they were getting a Pepsi. And so we need to have here calculate order total dollars that they go and do that subroutine at the end of the BTN add drink sub. So yeah, you just need to get that code added on to each of your uh, subroutines for the three different add buttons. And then we can actually look at what this calculate order total dollars subroutine, what it needs to do. So we're going to set the order total as zero first before we start. So every time they add a new item, we're going to go through the whole data grid and just grab everything and retotal it. Because remember how they could manually edit it? Maybe they went back and changed one of the burgers and took the egg off it. So everything should be a dollar less at the moment. But when we go through for the next thing they order, it'll kind of pick that up. So it should work, you know, uh, okay all the time. Now there's this INJ processing. You have to remember with a data grid view, it's got that blank row at the bottom. And then it's one less, remember, because it's starting at zero, not starting at one. So we're actually doing the counter from zero up to the total um, rows minus two. So we don't hit that bottom row, which causes a program crash. And also because we start at zero instead of one, uh, it's minus two. But on the columns, where the columns are just zero and one. So they're not one and two, they're actually one less than that. They're zero and one. So we have to, on the loop, put a minus one on that. So this is going along each row and then the J goes to each column in the row. So we're gonna be able to scan through bang, 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 all the way across row one for the data grid, and then go to row two and go all the way across, dit, 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 checking all the column contents. And we only want the ones where it's not equal to dash, dash, because remember dash, dash means it's nothing. So as we're going along, bang, bang, checking each one of those little boxes, uh, as long as the box isn't equal to dash, dash, which is nothing, uh, then it must be, you know, like CB or TS or LE. Then we need to do something and find out what the price is. So when it's not equal to nothing, uh, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to set the found price to zero. And then we're going to set the string current item code that we're on, the little box that we're in, uh, is given by the I and J values of where our loop is up to. So we're getting all that set up. And see, that was what we were doing just here. We've just repeated it here to show you where we're up to. And we're going to call a function that's going to take that current item code we're on, whether it's CB or maybe it's um, FR for fries or OR for onion rings, whatever that little item code is, it's going to go into this function with that item code value and find out what its price is and it'll return the price. Okay, so the coding for the function shown later, that's going to go right down the very bottom of the program. Um, and then once we found that price, we're going to add the found price on. Now, if the found price comes back as zero, that's a problem. That means it didn't find a price for that item. So we're going to give this error message, no price found for that item code. So the item price has been set just to zero because uh, that's some sort of problem in your prices CSV file that the, a programmer or someone needs to go and look at. Uh, else, uh, things are okay. And so we're just going to up the order total by how much that found price was. So whatever the found price was for that particular item, just add that onto the order total. So our order total will get bigger and bigger as it finds more items, okay? And then once it's finished going through the whole data grid view and these loops finish, I uh, was just gonna finalize everything. And this was making it get displayed as 0.00 or 0.50 because uh, VBNet didn't wanna do that. So we just do some rounding off. And then this code here, actually gets it displaying to two decimal places, okay? So that code there does that, and we won't explain exactly how it does it. That's just the sort of code you need to do to get your final um, dollar total before you show it on the form in two decimal places, all right? So now that function, the magic function we're talking about. So that was all about, you know, when they click to add a burger or something, it's going to go through the whole data grid view now after it's added that new row in and recalculate the price. So this is the one that takes the price code of whatever box we're in, say it's LE, and it's going to look up LE in that prices data table and work out what the price of LE is. All right, so this is how the function works. Now, if you don't understand functions at all, you probably need to go back and do our functions lesson, all right, so you understand how it is. Uh, but we're passing in the item code. And what happens here is this is really neat. Um, 
this code here that we're just using a select statement. So in that whole prices data table, um, you might be thinking, oh, wow, now we've got to write a loop to go through that whole prices data table looking for a match to find LE. So let's start at zero. Does zero equal LE? No, let's go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. We can just write some code to select on that table and VB does all that little um, checking through, reading the whole thing to find out where the heck LE is to get its price. It does it all for us with just this one line of code that does a select. The only tricky bit is, and this is where we had to go to Stack Overflow because we're having trouble, like it's okay to put item code equals um, LE for lettuce if you knew it's LE, but when we wanted any kind of item code coming in, any of our 16 as variables, it got trickier. And you have to use this tricky combination of single and double quotes and get that exactly right. And then it will take in whatever you've passed in as the item code and select that out of the prices data table and find that for you, okay? So that is really good. Now, this code here can select multiple items, all right? So say it was doing some table where we had uh, people's names in it and I don't know how many videos they'd watched on Passy's World of ICT. And, you know, as time progressed, uh, you know, John had watched sort of five videos, but then there was an entry in there, John had watched seven, John had watched nine, John had watched 10. So there were multiple rows with John in there. So if we were looking for the name was John, it could return multiple rows, okay, from a data table. And that's where this bit comes in. So we didn't change this because we thought this code might be um, useful another time when we're looking for things, because I know this is going to be useful when we do part two, actually, of uh, this project. And so what we've got here is we've just got a thing so that it'll actually just go through everything it found, if it found multiples, uh, and pull out the price. Okay, that's the whole thing we're trying to get, the find item price. So I just left this here because that's handy to have. But we've just put a condition here that the found rows count should be one, that it should only find that product code, that item code listed once with one price, okay? So if the found rows count is one, uh, then we can go ahead and pull out the price, all right? Because else here, there's a little bit more still to go on the function because uh, if it isn't just one row that was found, if there were multiple rows found for LE, for lettuce, maybe lettuce used to be only 80 cents and maybe LE now is $1, uh, there shouldn't be two. It should only have the current price, not um, old prices in there. So we're gonna give out this error message, okay? So we're not gonna pass back a price. It'll just pass back zero as the price and set up this error message here, okay? And show that to the user. And then we need to return the find item price out of the uh, function back up to the subroutine which called this function. So yeah, if all that kind of stuff has been really messing with your mind, go back and watch our functions lesson, uh, the video and things on that, and then it'll make sense. So whew, we have finally completed all that calculating the total uh, code. And now of course it needs to be tested. All right, so we need to check out a few different orders here and see how those total prices work out. All right, so here's uh, an order. Now, unfortunately, the red on the white, it looks okay on a computer screen, but when you print screened it here into PowerPoint, it's not quite as clear. Perhaps they weren't good color choices. Maybe this should have been dark brown. Uh, who knows? But anyway, we've got a ground beef burger, a GB with tomato sauce and cheese by the looks of it. Uh, so that should be um, not much, and it is not much. It's only $8. Okay, now let's check that out because this is our prices file here. So I've got a ground burger, which is six. We've got tomato sauce, which is a dollar and cheese, which is another dollar, six and one, seven. And another one is $8, which we got here for the total. So that is all working beautifully. And we give it the big happy face tick. Our next one here, we've ordered quite a few things here. We've got uh, a beef burger, but now we've got some fries and we've got a Pepsi and we've got a bottle of water and that's come out at $20. Now let's just check out those prices out in our prices file, the CSV file here, looking at it in Notepad. Uh, that should be six and one, seven, eight, uh, five, eight and five would be 13 and then 350 and 350 is seven. So 13 and seven would be $20. So that's all working out okay. 
uh, that maths was too much for you just get a calculator and add them up yourself but you really need to do this sort of testing because money is really important if you don't want an application to get money wrong because uh, that could actually be a criminal offense too for the person operating uh, that system uh, to be overcharging or undercharging customers uh, so that's not good so we always need to check this very very carefully so we'll do a couple more here this one came out $24. We're getting a couple of fries, a couple of drinks and a burger. And so, yeah, if we check out all the pricing on that and add these all up. Now for fries here, we just did two arrows, meaning we got two lots of them. So that's five and five is $10 worth of fries here because you can see FR and FR. So that one worked out okay. And this last one here just had a side order, just fries and onion rings and a drink. Uh, someone trying to do it a bit cheaper at $13.50 and that'll give us five and five is 10 and 350 would be 13.50. So yeah, that's all working. And we tried out a couple others as well, which we're not showing here, but look, that is all good. That's definitely working okay. Calculating the order total dollars. So yeah. It doesn't look much when you look at the test results here because there's just one box where, hey, it gets the correct money for the order. How about that? But um, as you can see, that was kind of quite a bit of coding and a bit of work to do that. And that's taken us out to 50 minutes for the video. And we've still got quite a bit to do because we've got validation to do. Oh, and whenever we say validation, all our students go, you can hear it in the room. It's just, I like to say validation and then just stop because you sort of hear this, this sort of, you know, oh, we're about to be taken off and beaten, you know, of a stick or something in the prisons. Uh, yeah, it's just, they're not looking forward to it at all. But look, validation, we've done so much of it now, guys. It isn't that hard. And you can copy and paste stuff from old programs because that's all we did uh, here when we were doing this. So when that add order button is clicked to add the order, we just got to make sure there's a name and a phone for the order. The date time picker takes care of the date all right and defaults to today's date. So that's good. And we got to make sure there's at least one item in that data grid view that they've actually ordered something because there's no point in adding an order for someone's name and phone number when there's nothing that they ordered. Uh, okay, so we need to be checking that this isn't blank phone number is not left blank uh, and phone number is the correct format for an Australian phone number so we need to do quite a little bit of checking there but we've done it all before in different programs so if you go back to our password program you can see where we did all this validation and I think there was even a whole lesson on validation as validation and ASCII regex go back to that lesson because we're going to be using regex again in this and we got the whole data grid view so we need to make sure they've at least picked and clicked and ordered at least one thing in this so as long as those three things have things in them and the phone is the correct type of phone number then the add order is all good to go and that's going to just give them a message at the moment that yep the order successfully uh process but in part two we'll actually process it and we'll take everything that's on this screen here and write it out as records in an output file but we're not doing that in this lesson because it would like blow this out into some sort of two hour lesson or something like that so look validation user inputs this is all familiar territory so we'll try to go through it pretty quick uh, we need to have um, imports here because we're going to be using regex so regular expressions so make sure you add that imports at the top we need to have here the old boolean all inputs are valid so we check every single thing and just give it one big indicator here to pass back to the upper subroutine that yep everything is good to go and we're also going to have something here that um to check whether an order's been added yet we're going to need that when we do the clear button which is coming up after validation and that's the last thing we have to do but let's get through validation so that's why we're having this boolean order added here at the moment in case you're wondering what that was about and look when they click btn add order okay we're just going to set initially that all the inputs valid is false that they may have done something wrong on the form left the phone number off or something like that and the order hasn't been added yet because they've just clicked the add button to do it uh, and we're going to have this whole separate routine that validates the user inputs and when that routine's finished hopefully it's going to pass back that all inputs valid equals true and if that happens uh, then we can set that the order's added and we can give a message box order added successfully okay now if that does all the stuff and there's something wrong down in here it'll put out error messages and it's not going to tell them the order is submitted yet or set it to true okay so it's not going to do anything so let's get into that subroutine here uh, which is going to do all of the checking of the phone the name and the data grid view so look this is all familiar stuff um, from our old validation uh, 
lessons. And I even just copied and pasted this out of uh, an old lesson and just changed it to say TXT order name in TXT phone. So that's pretty standard checking that something isn't left blank and giving an error message. And we just exit the subroutine. Um, there's no more checking to do. As soon as one thing's wrong, we don't want to bombard them with five messages of five things are wrong. Just tell them the first thing that's wrong and we can wait for them to fix that up before we check any more and see if anything else is wrong as well. So that's just being nice for the user, just telling them one little uh, improvement point at a time. And, you know, the phone number for Australia needs to be 10 digits long. So, yeah, if you're in a different country, like if you're in the USA or in the UK, perhaps, uh, you may need to change this code slightly to fit your phone numbers because our phone numbers always also have to start with zero. So we've got another thing here where we just check uh, the substring. So it does the first character equal a zero for the phone number. So we're checking that out. We're checking it's um, 10 characters long, checking out that it starts with zero. Then we need to check out that it's only got numbers in it as well. So uh, we're doing that with the regex. So we've got the old regex mask in here. And if it does have hyphens or spaces or letters, something which isn't a dig digit number in all 10 positions, uh, they'll get this message. They'll have to enter the phone number like that. So we're not having dashes or any spaces. We're just having one continuous number here and uh, give them that error message. And notice we've got that order phone focus to put the thing back into the phone message box, the cursor, so it's blinking saying, here's where you need to fix it. Here's where you need to fix it. Uh, right, and that'll just go down and do all that stuff. And then at the end, we need to check out how did all of these checks go as we were coming down here? Because we haven't exited the sub at all, so they probably went all okay, but we'll just do a final check of that. So if the Boolean name's not blank and the phone's not blank and the phone length is okay and the phone starts with zero and the phone number is numeric and there was some Boolean items ordered, on the data grid view. Oh yeah, how we do that is that's very simple. In that data grid view, if the rows count is zero, that means that they haven't ordered anything. There's no rows in that data grid. So that was a very quick and easy check to check that at least one item was ordered, okay? And yeah, if all of those have come up good, uh, then we can put Boolean all inputs valid is true. Otherwise, Boolean all inputs valid is true. Now I need to make that a false. That's actually wrong. Okay, so that should be a false. All right, so if you get the downloads for the lesson, the step-by-step -step instructions, that will all be fixed up because uh, that should be a false there. Okay, so now we need to fully test this validation coding. Um, yeah, now I probably never got to here in the testing. I'm just thinking, why didn't testing find this mistake in the coding? Yeah, because look, if anything was wrong, we've got these exit subs. So it would have exited out the subroutine and never even got to here. So maybe this, probably, you know, this code isn't even needed at all, but we will fix that up to say equals false even though it seems like the logic never actually even can possibly hit this row here. If you think about it, and we need to can be continually thinking about things. So while we're testing it, the name, uh, not thinking about things here and forgot to put the name in. Oops, we get an error message. Please enter a name for the order. So it's not even gonna worry that the phone's blank. We're just gonna hit them up with the first thing that's wrong here. And that's that the name hasn't been entered, all right? So they enter a name, that's okay. They've got Johnny in there. But they've left this blank and they've clicked the add order button. So what will happen there is we get the please enter a phone number. They enter a phone number, but it's a, a little one three number that's way too short. It needs to be 10 digits long for an Australian, uh, the sort of Australian phone number we're after. So we tell them phone number must be 10 digits long. All right. So what happens next is uh, they put in a 10 digit phone number here, but it doesn't start with zero, right? In Australia, our numbers need to start with zero. So that's no good. We tell them the first digit of the phone number must be zero. So what they do now is they put a zero in, but they also decide they're going to put a hyphen in to separate these and make it a bit more readable, which is nice. But we want our, our phone as just a string of continual numbers without hyphens or spaces. Okay, so we just tell them that enter the phone number like O and then all these numbers don't have spaces or dashes, make sure it's all numbers. So uh, 
they do that we've got it starting with an O and it's 10 digits long and that looks like an Australian mobile phone number okay so names okay phone numbers okay so it'll get down in the checking and check out that data grid view and it checks finds that the row count for that is zero there's no rows filled in with anything so it says at least one item must be ordered please add items to the order so when they click add order it's not going to go ahead it'll just stop here when it finds that mistake that they haven't ordered anything and finally if they have put in their name put in their phone and they've actually ordered some stuff and it only has to be one item but here they've just got three items they've ordered and they click add order well that is great and we get the order added successfully message um, and then click ok and that message disappears so that's all working fine really good so that's great now we've just got one more thing to do the clear order button all right, so the final thing we need is this clear order button. It's going to clear out the name, phone number, everything that's in the data grid view. After they've uh, added it, the idea is they clear it so they can have another customer come in and they can do their order. So if we double click the clear order button, uh, we're going to need an are you sure message because they might want to clear it because they were putting in this order and then they realized, oh, this order is so messed up. I can't even go back in the data grid view and edit things. The whole thing's messed up. Why don't I just clear it all and let's start again? Or maybe some customer's really indecisive and they ordered three chicken burgers and then they went, oh no, the boys probably like beef. So um, yeah, I might get the two boys beef burgers instead. And the, whole, and the whole thing's all messed up and they just say, okay, let's just start again. They can click clear. So sometimes it's okay if they haven't done add yet and they want to clear it because it's all messed up. So we're just going to give them a message here and that's the code we put in. And here's how it works when you test it the current order has not been added are you sure you want to clear and reset the screen form okay so that will just give them a warning message in case they go oh gee we better not clear it because we haven't even added that order in yet and they can go back and click the add button but maybe it's all messed up and even though they definitely haven't added it because it's messed up and they just want to clear it so they'll say are you sure and they can go yes and they can clear a messed up order that way so we're just putting that in there and then if it gets down to here in the processing, it hasn't exited the sub because they do actually want to do clearing. So what we can do first is we'll clear those three text boxes. So clear out the name, clear out the phone, and clear out the dollar total text box. Just set all of those to nothing and that will do that on the form when you test it. And then we need to clear out the uh, any kind of um, radio buttons that are clicked at the moment, except we did want ground beef to be a default there. Uh, so they couldn't just add something in that was a completely blank row. So we're just going to set uh, the ground beef one to true, but everything else to false. So they'll all be unticked, unclicked. Uh, so that's that. And then we need to untick all of these options. So when they're clearing the form, anything that was just ticked here from the last burger they ordered, just set all of those to false. So yeah, these things here, when you uh, add these items into a checked list box, they kind of end up like an array. Uh, most things in VB are an array. So the first one is actually number zero, and then they go zero, one, two, three, four, and eight would be number chili sauce here. So we're just setting all those to false. That's how you do the coding for that when you've got a checked list box. So that's something new we're learning in this lesson, how to look after and work with check list boxes, which are very handy. And we need to clear out everything uh, in the data grid view. Now the easiest way to do that is not to try and go through and set everything to nothing in all those cells. Uh, that's going to just take crazy amounts of time to do. What we do is we just create a kind of refresh it. We make a new one. So we just create a new data table over the top of the data table in memory, which is feeding this data grid view. And we just redefine all the columns again for this brand new one we're making. And it's got the same name as the old one. So it'll overwrite the old one. And then we just have the one liner here that the data grid view on our form make the data source this brand new empty one we've just made and that will then cause you to get this it'll clear it out and just make a brand new blank um, data grid view ready to go okay so that's how we kind of clear out all these values here we actually just make a new uh, data the data table behind here is feeding this grid so we just kind of make a brand new copy of that bang it goes over the top of the old copy of all the columns defined and then that will make this down here which is a cleared out data grid view so that's all good that completes that now we did notice uh, one other thing that when we were testing 
After you added a burger, I kind of left all the things ticked for a previous burger, which was kind of a bit user unfriendly because maybe you just added a burger where someone wanted everything. They wanted cheese, tomato, lettuce, egg, I want chili sauce, I want all those extras. And the next person that comes along just says, oh, I just want a cheeseburger and I don't want anything else but cheese and the burger. Uh, you've got to go and unclick all those things that were just ticked last time for the one that wanted the burger with the lot. So it'd be a lot nicer if when they click add burger, it just clears all that out ready for the next burger that you're going to add in. So it's kind of a mini clear form, but it only just clears out the burger information. Okay. So we added these sections at the end of the add button subroutine for the BTN add burger. We just set stuff there to uh, just reset um, all of those checkbox values. And we did a similar thing like on side orders. We just did a thing to make sure opt fries wasn't um, clicked on and the onion rings wasn't clicked on. So both of those were empty radio buttons and make the drinks one at the bottom of the BTN ad drink. Just make sure all those radio buttons are sort of empty radio buttons that aren't clicked at the moment. So we just did that kind of mini little clears uh, after you've added an item just to make it nice and easy to add the next item. Okay, so challenge task two, that's actually kind of part one of the burger ordering system finished and hopefully you can build all that and test it because you're going to need to add on to it and you'll need to do this challenge task. Now the challenge task is we need kind of a customer friendly receipt because that data grid view of all the codes in it, someone using the system is going to know all the codes but like customer might not realize that EG means that they had egg on their hamburger. So they need something a lot more user friendly and normal too. Plus I think it's really weird if they get this Cody kind of thing given to them for a receipt or shown for a receipt. If they're going, what, $45? How could it possibly cost that much? Well, you can have this friendly itemized thing which shows them in clear plain English exactly what they ordered. Now we have a lesson how to use data across multiple forms and we grabbed data and formatted remember an email to someone who hadn't paid for their doctor's appointment visit. So if you use the kind of ideas in that the ideas of the data tables and reading CSV files that we've just learned in this lesson, you should be able to do this challenge task and put this all together. You will need another CSV file. So we need one called item code descriptions.csv. So just make this up a Windows notepad, save it and then put it in the bin debug folder of your project. So we just got all those codes again with the commas to separate the values. But here instead of prices, we've got the sort of plain English description of what they all are because the person's going to want to see this on their receipt. They're not going to want to see these two character codes. So you need to set this up and then you need to load it up into a data table, a descriptions data table, just like we have with the prices one. And then it can be searched just like we've done with the prices one in here to find matches. So like we did for working out the total, you know how we went totally through that data grid view, just scanning. And every time we hit an item, we did some processing to find out its price and add that to the total. You're going to scan through the exact same way, but every time you hit an item code, you're going to go and find its description in here, right? In this uh, thing, which you've loaded up into a data table. And then you're going to also look up its price and combine those two things together and make a string line. So what we suggest to get this kind of invoice uh, receipt happening here, what we need is we need to uh, have a rich text box on our pop-up form. And remember we passed a really big long string into there that we'd assembled by gathering all these different bits together and putting VB carriage return line feeds in between them to make the blank lines and new lines and stuff. So what you'll need to do is you kind of need to have this uh, a, a, a new line that you're building that says like maybe beef burger and six dollars and when you've built that line you just need to add that onto the text in this other pop-up form so you should be able to cross-reference across the forms using that previous lesson and say this is going to be in form two you could just say okay form two um, dot rtb rich text box whatever it is dot text now equals what it used to be plus this new line that you're adding in. Okay, so you could progressively kind of format the text box and then when you finish, you get across and open up that form and display it all in there. Okay, so 
we're just showing you here what the mock-up of the receipt looks like. It'll be up to you to um, do some coding and testing. There shouldn't be any really new knowledge of things that we have not covered so far in this lesson and that previous one on data across multiple forms. Uh, all of the sort of things you need should be there, the knowledge, and it's up to you to kind of put it all together and build it and test it. And that'll be quite a reasonable challenge uh, for you, but it's something we're not doing for you because uh, you know, you need to sort of experience this building with your bare hands stuff yourself. Uh, and you should be able to do that now. You definitely got all the skills uh, to do that. It just might be time consuming and take a little while, but anything worthwhile takes a while. So just remember that. Uh, right, so when we get to part two of this lesson, which might be next week, hopefully that's what's gonna happen. Uh, we're gonna add some savings. So when they click add order, it's actually gonna save the order into, into an external orders file. And then once we've got all these orders in there, you can put in someone's name and phone number and pick and click a date. And when you click that search button, it's gonna go to this file and have a look through it and find all the stuff for that order bring it into the program and put it onto the data grid view, okay? So we'll be able to look up old orders as well as putting in new orders to the system, okay? So that's gonna be the, the part two lesson, uh, adding orders to an external file and then being able to search through that external file for a particular order we're interested in having a look at. And then once you've got that external file too, you could add on stuff for your application so that it can work out on a certain day um, how many uh, chicken burgers did they actually sell? So I can kind of do this sales statistics and that for the business owner as well. So once you've got that external file, you can do a lot of things with it, okay? So processing it and getting information out of it. Because remember, once you have data, us computer programmer guys, that's what we like to do. We like to make programs that can assemble that into useful information for people. And that's the value add. That's why we get paid for our skills of doing what we do uh, when you are a professional programmer. So remember, if you need to look up any of those old lessons, just go to the passiveworldofict.com website to programming. Um, that'll give you the whole list of lessons step by step in the order that they should be done. You can find an old one, click on it, go to the lesson, the video, a link to the videos there and all the things you need for that. So that's all good. And that's the end of this lesson. So if you found this lesson useful, give it a big thumbs up like there on YouTube and also subscribe to our channel uh, because that way you get notified every time we do do a video update. So that way you can keep an eye out for when that Burgers part two lesson does come out and that'll all be good. And yeah, have fun and enjoy programming with VBNet.